Welcome everybody to this session about generative artificial intelligence for bioimage analysis. Um, before we dive deep into the topic, um, I have two things for you. So I just shared in the chat two links. The first link is you can download the slides. So I will show from time to time, I will show a notebook where you can reproduce what I'm talking about. You can try out things yourself. Also by the end, there will be some exercises um, and you can, you have a better, you have an easier life when you download these slides and click on these links instead of taking screenshots and typing. It should be easier like that. Um, and the second thing is, I would like to make it an, inter an interactive thing. And that's why I prepared here a little survey. Um, it's three questions, so it will just take two minutes or something like that. I would like to ask you to click on this link um, or use the QR code with your smartphone um, and fill out this little survey. It is at the end three questions. Um, and we can also have a look at that, um, maybe even live while you are doing this, um, so that we get an overview about um, the three questions. So the first question is, how often do you use large language models like ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, or all the other typical suspects? Um, do you use them never? Something like several times a month or several times a week? or several times a day. Um, we are now 35 participants. We have 11 answers. So maybe after we have 20 answers, I can show the results. So I'm doing similar surveys whenever I give this talk or whenever I give a similar talk. So I try to see a little bit um, how this is changing over time, because I would presume that uh, if I ask this question in five years, the answers, the distribution of answers will be a little bit different. <clears throat> so if two more people would reply, <laughs> that would be great. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so we have 20 answers, so we can have a look. Um, so yeah, most of the people are using it at least on a monthly basis, um, which is actually um, uh, on a weekly basis, actually, which is actually not too bad. So depending on to which audience I speak, is, I see this distribution often also a bit more on the left. So it's great to talk to people today who are using it already on a regular basis. It's fantastic. Um, next question. What do you use large language models for? So generating text like papers, grant proposals, <laughs> the typical stuff. Um, generating code, we will also look at that. And generating images, we will look into that today. Um, asking it, for example, to generate code for plotting some data. You know, this must plot lib stuff is complicated. Um, analyzing data, analyzing images, or answering questions like what you Googled some years ago. So let's also have a look here. So G and a and B. So generating text, generating code. And yeah, the, the, the things we Googled some time ago are quite popular here. Third question, also a very interesting one for me. Whenever you use ChatGPT, um, how often are the results correct or the code functional which you get back? So very often, often, occasionally, rarely, and I basically try to outline that it's like very often you could say in three out of four cases it works. Um, rarely means in less than one out of four cases answers are correct or answers are useful. So let's have a look here. B and C. So somewhere around every second uh, attempt works. So that's also something I I see often when you enter something and you get some some crap back. So you enter it again a little bit differently and then it suddenly makes sense. So a 50-50 chance in the first attempt is quite realistic. Um, so thanks again for participating. Um, again, I would like to have this kind of an, an interactive session. So please interrupt me, ask questions when I explain something on the slide. Um, if this was a session where we chat a lot with each other, that would be fantastic. If I'm speaking all the time, that's okay too. But I prefer the interactive day. Um, so yeah, we already spoke a little bit about it. And obviously, according to the survey, most of you know it. So if you talk about artificial intelligence and daily code of life, so years ago we were using Google for asking stuff. So for example, um, why are scientists German. <laughs> so Google makes here some predictions of the next word I'm, I might be entering. Maybe it knows that I'm a German and that's why it's proposing that. But it's obviously not 
overly excitingly smart. Um, and that's like a technology we have around for years, which was developed, of course, which changed over the years. But suddenly we deal with tools like that. So this is now GitHub Copilot in action. Um, and I'm here trying to write documentation for this function. So I have here this function called agglomerative clustering. It has some parameters. And I would like to type now the documentation for that. And this looks like that. So you start typing the name and it basically auto completes entire sentences. And these sentences make sense. So this is now the power of large language models, artificial intelligence helping us to write code. And as we have um, explained the term agglomerative clustering on the internet many times, and as many of Python functions have been written before, which are available on the internet, um, artificial intelligence researchers eventually managed um, to basically build a so-called large language model from all that data, which can now help us to write more code. So that's super nice and quite an advancement over this auto completion in the Google search field from some years ago. So just quickly uh, having a look at the definition, what does artificial, what, what does generative artificial intelligence mean? I think that's from Wikipedia. Um, so generative artificial intelligence is a type of artificial intelligence system that is capable of generating text images or other media in response to prompts. So commonly this is based on neural networks and it basically bridges the two research fields of lang natural language processing and computer vision. So we basically put these two together and have exciting new results. So you see here, for example, we take a bunch of noise, some noisy random pixels and a sentence or a, a, a couple of words describing what we want, what we expect. Um, and then the artificial intelligence might be able to generate an image which corresponds to what we said and which is basically seeded from the noise. Um, use cases, we have already seen it in the in the survey at the very beginning. So translating text, writing emails, text, grant proposals, um, summarizing articles, very nice, and in particular writing code. So we will mostly look at that today, um, general question answering and generating images. So that's kind of the common use cases people on the internet nowadays talk a lot about because it's kind of a game changer what we have in hand here now for a bit much like a year. So how does it work in very general? So this is here, this slide is the explanation or I basically extracted it as an explanation of um, how stable diffusion works. So you have basically, you take an image um, and you make a little, make it a little bit more noisy and you train a network which takes this noisy image and a sentence describing the image and then produces the original image ideally. That's how it's trained. Um, from that, and you can do this with different with different noise levels, and you can come to a point where basically the network gets just noise. It's like really the original image is not visible anymore, but the sentence, and as it was trained on all these individual noise levels, it is capable of taking random noise at the end and a sentence um, to produce an image which corresponds to what is described in this sentence. The major challenge in this research field was. How can I combine noise, image data, two-dimensional pixel grid, and a sentence? How can I put human language into the loop of this neural network? How can I combine these um, two information sources and make something useful out of it? Um, and while we were training networks for many years, this is kind of from an architecture point of view, from my perspective, that's the new thing. Um, so what they basically do, they take a so-called word embedding. So this is basically a multi-dimensional, a high-dimensional vector space. So we see here just two dimensions, but in fact, in practice, it's something like 500 or 1000 dimensions where we put words in. And these words have then coordinates in this space. And you see, for example, that black and white, these two words are close by each other because they both describe a color. Um, furthermore, a microscope is like not so closely related to black and white, but a microscope can be black or a microscope can be white as a cat can. So also the cat has a similar distance to these colors like the microscope, even though microscope and cats also do not have so much in common. Also the fur, <laughs> cats can have fur. Microscopes with a fur are rare. <laughs> That's why the distance um, here is, is, is farther, is longer. Uh, so this is basically a word embedding, how you can how you can have a language embedded in a word embedding um, where words can get coordinates in this super high dimensional space. And this is basically a way to turn text, to turn words into numbers, and then you can feed it as it's been numerical, you can feed a vector into a neural network. The fun part here is how do they come up with this vector space? So yeah, this is also a neural network, which does it. 
And if you think about how this network is trained, there is a mechanism in there which puts words into context to each other. Um, and there's a term called self-attention. It has something to do with the relationship between a word and the neighboring words in the sentence. So when we look, for example, here at the word white in this sentence, and we look um, to the other words in the sentence, that there is a strong relationship between the fur and the white because we are describing this fur with a color white. That's why there is a large relationship. The attention score is high. It's four in this case. Um, also some relationship with black because um, they are connected with an end together. But on the other hand, if you look at the, uh, at the beginning of the sentence, the word that has pretty much no relationship with the white and that's why this attention score here is lower. And also if you now wonder how do they compute this attention, also this is the neural network. So some years ago, um, we were heavily involved in training networks for solving one particular problem like image denoising or transforming the image in another image, which allows us to segment objects more easily or training multiple networks to produce multiple images, which in combination allow us to um, segment an image more easily. But it was always like this one thing. And now we have architectures of networks which train networks which are necessary to train networks and then we can produce an image out of a sentence. Um, so that's pretty amazing. This is the technology advancing here. Um, and uh, I find it pretty fascinating. That's why I also prepared these slides here. So if you look at the daily life of an image analyst like myself, um, so we produce Python code, sometimes Napari plugins. So here you see one of my Napari plugins, Napari Simple IDK Image Processing. Um, and you see how these widgets here, these windows were programmed with a pull down where I choose an image and a run button. And if I now play this video, you see I can click on these run buttons and then I get a segmentation out. So this is like many of us are working like that. You take an algorithm, a common thing, and you put a user interface on top of it and then users can use it. So that's nice. That's what we earned our money with for many years. And now suddenly there's ChatGPT which can do pretty much the same thing. So here you see Louis Croyer, a video from his uh, repository of um, Napari ChatGPT. And he asks Napari ChatGPT to produce a widget where you can click on the run button and produce segmentation. So that's pretty amazing. Apparently ChatGPT is capable of doing these kind of things. Um, Louis mentioned in his tweet, he, he called it a weekend project and later he, he basically said it took him something like multiple weekends. <laughs> Uh, but it's obviously not a thing. Um, a hundred scientists, so this, this Napari plugin, which is capable of programming new Napari plugins, is obviously not work of a hundred people working for 10 years. They just took ChatGPT and put a small thin layer on top of it, which is capable of dealing with Napari, with image analysis and with segmenting nuclei. Um, so this, what I'm saying is like, it's not like super hardcore magic work. It's like at hand, we can do these kind of things now. And I would like to show you how this technology works so that you can also afterwards program similar stuff. Um, yes, in order to do that, just a short detour, the word deconstruction in the bioimage analysis field is quite common. I think Kota Miyoha introduced it at some point. I'm not 100% sure, but we are using this technique um, to disassemble software, to look in image analysis, algorithms, tools, plugins, how they work. And basically we would like to understand how they work. We would like, then if we know how other stuff works, we do not have to reinvent them. We can just reuse parts of them or just use the tools and advance them. Um, also what is very important in the scientific image analysis field is like typically we deconstruct algorithms and tools to identify their limitations and bottlenecks. Um, you hear also similar terms, reverse engineering, code reviewing, pair programming. So it belongs in this list of things computer scientists, software developers, data scientists do in order to solve problems. And as we have now ChatGPT writing code for us, we should definitely be capable of reading code. So this, the next two or three slides are reading exercise. We will look into Napari ChatGPT, how it works. We will deconstruct it a little bit in order to figure out how to do similar things. So when you look in Napari ChatGPT, the slides are a little bit outdated, but you can click here on the bottom on these links. You will come to the Git version of the code which corresponds to these slides. Today, um, Napari ChatGPT looks a little bit different, but the principles are still the same. That's why I did not update these slides. So when you look in Napari ChatGPT, it defines uh, it defines a list of tools. 
So when you look in this folder tools, you see here a couple of tools. There's the Napari file open tool and the Napari widget maker tool. So you see there's a couple of tools defined and you can also ask Omega, this is this graphical interface, you can also ask Omega, what tools do you have available? And it will then tell you that it can do a web search, it can look into Wikipedia, it has this um, Napari um, file open tool and the Napari widget maker tool. So it can also answer if you want to know what these things are doing. Um, and if you look in one of these tools, actually commonly very, very short Python code. So it's not complex analysis stuff. So here you see the Google search tool and it basically only consists of a run function which has a query and forwards this to another function which also has this query parameter some more parameters which are not specified. But at the end does it sends a request to Google, a question something um, and retrieves the result and turns it into a string and returns the string. So the important thing of what is the tool here in this context is it's a, it's a function which has a string as input and produces a string as output. So this is also when you think about, you are communicating with ChatGPT with a language model, you want to know um, how to how you code for question XY looks like. Um, it is a string in, you, the, the question you send, and it, the response is also a string out, so a text in, text out. So this is how tools in this technology here work. Um, there's also the Napari widget maker, and when you look into this one, you will see that it's not so much Python code. I think it's similar, also a short class. But additionally, it's plenty of strings describing a task. So for example, you competently write image processing and image analysis functions in Python. And these functions should be pure, self-contained, effective, well-written, syntactically correct. So it's basically describing the task to the language model in very detail. And also when you watch other YouTube videos and other explanations from other people, um, you will you will notify this pattern that you, for example, typically in these prompts, in these texts, you specify, please write well-written high quality Python code. So this is a common thing people add at the very beginning um, in order to make the chance higher that the code which comes out is really a high quality thing and not just some random assembled code. So the language model reacts to these kind of requests. Um, then uh, this, the Napari widget maker will internally produce a function which is then executed when you click on this run button. Um, and for these things, there's also some additional hints he gives here. For example, he has to introduce the language model to the fact that you do not have to create a new Napari window. The Napari window is already there. So, and uh, the question if it's like uh, in uppercase or lowercase, it's a good question if this makes a difference for the language model, we don't know. Um, but uh, sometimes you have to also iterate a bit on it and have to phrase these things multiple times so that the language model really takes it then as that. Um, and then at the very bottom, the, the question you ask, the text you specify actually goes there. So that's what we call prompt engineering. We write a short sentence of what we want, but we provide additional text to introduce the language model in very detail, very carefully of what it is supposed to do. Do not create an Apari window, but um, add a new widget to it. <clears throat> so this is how also a tool can look like. It's then specified, it's not written in Python, it's basically written in English language, um, which is quite nice. And you can try out such things yourself. Again, you see here on the bottom, there's a link to a notebook where you find some instructions on how to do this. I just show the most important thing. So here you find um, a simple prompt, I would call it, um, and um, so let's have a look at the simple prompt first. So again, please write Python code. This Python code should load this image file, label the result, label the objects in this image, and visualize the result. I additionally provided some hints. So for example, this code will be executed in a Jupyter notebook. So do not um, save the result. Just display them as if it was executed in a Jupyter notebook. And then it will produce code like that. And you can execute this code and it will then, for example, solve this problem of segmenting the blobs in this particular image. Again, there's a notebook you can download, you can execute. Then I call it a simple prompt because loading an image and segmenting some bright blobs is a common task. You find online endless numbers of discussions of how to do this and a lot of Python code um, demonstrating for how to do these things. Threshold O2 is a very common technique for doing that. 
um, the label function from scikit image does this connected component labeling is capable of solving these problems. And that's why ChatGPT, the language model, knows about the common solutions. But if you make this prompt more complicated, so here, for example, I'm adding just another task. In principle, the prompt is pretty much the same, but I'm now asking also after labeling the object and the image, can you please draw a mesh between the labels with a maximum distance of 50 pixels? That's complicated. <laughs> There's not so much Python code online, uh, not so much discussions where people um, are talking about that. So the ChatGPT is not capable of doing that. Um, so this will crash, this will not work. But if you again provide a more detailed prompt, like for example here, I'm now adding um, this hint providing professional Python code, and I'm also providing a code snippet for drawing a mesh between objects. And then here, this is this one liner of this um, Clasperanto library I'm maintaining, which has this function available. Then suddenly the language model is capable of doing that. So you could theoretically, if you have a list of favorite functions, so you do image analysis day by day, and you're using the same functions over and over, and you're using similar, you're doing similar projects all the time, you could basically write a prompt like that where you explain your favorite functions to the to ChatGPT to the language model, and then the language model would be capable of using your favorite functions. Um, just a proof, yeah, proof in quotation marks, because if I'm not sure if you execute this notebook now, the results would be the same. But back in the days when I was executing this notebook, um, I had as a for loop which executes this prompt 10 times, and then the first result is a user warning, the second result looks like that, um, the third result is an error message, the fourth result looks again very similar to the first one, and also this one looks similar to the first one, and so on. So there's variations of the results, but it is capable of drawing this mesh. Um, and just some statistics, so um, the prompt was delivered useful results um, in five out of ten cases, and it produced error messages in four out of ten cases. And this is pretty similar to what we have seen at the beginning in the survey. So half of the prompts are successful, the other half has a little glitch or some problem. <clears throat> so you can, so this is like, this is nice for generating code, executing code. Um, I think it becomes more obvious, the same principle that you have to engineer your prompt. Um, it becomes more obvious if you generate images. So here I'm showing, also this is the Python Jupyter Notebook you can download and try yourself. Um, here I'm using DALI, um, also from OpenAI, um, to generate images um, of a cat, uh, image of a cat sitting behind the microscope. And if you look then in what it outputs here, these images look um, quite realistic, but also very different. Yeah. And if you compare it to the one image, the third one here, um, which is a real cat, which is the cat which may also walk later through the screen here, um, pixel I live together with her. Um, so it, 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 it definitely looks different than that one. So is it possible to write a prompt which makes these other images look more closely to the real cat image? And that's, from my perspective, that's the case. If you write more a more detailed prompt, for example, I want to have an image of a cat sitting behind the microscope. Um, both, both are on brown floor uh, in front of a white wall. The cat is mostly white, but has some black dots. So you have to really specify in very detail the scene you want to have, similar to the code you are generating before. And then you get images out like that, which are much closer to the realistic one. Um, what I find also fascinating in this context, because it's not so obvious what's the reason, um, the white wall. Why are these white walls not white <laughs> in compar compared to a white wall where I photograph the cat? <laughs> so the, I, I'm pretty sure that ChatGPT is, is capable of, of drawing a white wall, but the likelihood is obviously quite low. It may have something to do with the light conditions under which the training data was taken, but I'm speculating. Um, this also becomes fun if you ask for generating images of different kinds. So for example, here, I'm asking for a single high resolution black white image of a realistically looking orange fruit slice image with two T2 weighted magnetic resonance imaging. That's quite specific, very detailed. Um, and you can see these quite realistically looking images uh, coming out of the machine. Um, if you ask, I, I do, I'm also here, I also asked that on Twitter and you see um, the two third of the people are capable of identifying this one image, which is the realistic one, but a third is not. And now I'm speculating that if you would do this survey in a panel of radiologists, 
this result would look very different. And I basically have this slide here. Um, if you go into this field, if you start building your own models and you want to then later uh, measure the quality of these models, please choose your target, or target audience accordingly. Um, so if you generate MRI images, then radiologists should, should judge the result, not like random people from the street, but experts from the specific domain. Um, so the just saying for quality assurance, that might be important. Good. So we have now seen how um, you can fine tune prompts, how you can write text very carefully so that the results become better. There's another aspect in Napari ChatGPT, um, a very useful tool called LangChain, um, which basically uh, allows us to combine these tools. So I prepared here another example where you see how this works. Um, so I have two Python functions. The one function is called uppercase, the other one is called reverse. Um, and the one function makes the text a string uppercase and the other one reverts the characters in the string. And then you have to basically build a list of tools. So here you see this is a list and these tools, that's a class from Langchain. You have to provide your function. The function has to have a name and the function has to have a description, which commonly starts with something like useful for, and then you describe what this function is doing in order to introduce the language model to, if you want to do that, call this function. If you want to do this, call the other function. So here in this case, we're just showing it with uppercase and reversing. Um, and also here you find, I think on the next slide, there's the link to the notebook where you can try that out yourself. You have to then define also some memory. So Langchain offers you some convenient functions so that the model you are talking to, the chat model, um, also gets some memory. Then you create this chat open AI thing. And from these variables, from the from the list of tools, from the language model, and from the memory, you can produce an agent. Agent is then an object you can talk to. For example, you can say agent dot run and input, hi, I'm Robert, and it will respond, nice to meet you, Robert. Um, and then you ask it, what's my name? And it can tell you because it has this memory implemented. It can then tell you that your name is Robert. Um, so this is basically how the memory works and how you interact with the agent. And the fun part is now you can ask, can you please reverse my name? And it will then in this very kind response say, the response to your last comment was Drebor, which is your name reversed. And you can also ask it, um, do you know my name reversed in uppercase? And it can also combine these things. So it is under the hood calling these two functions and executing, like really executing Python code and combining the results of this execution. Also here, string in, string out is combining the results and will respond to you. So if you, for example, commonly in your daily work life, send emails to specific people with specific content, which is repeatedly always the same. You could theoretically write a Python function which sends this email with this content. And you can then ask Langchain, hey Langchain, can you please send this email I'm sending every day? <laughs> and it will do it for you because it can execute Python code, which is pretty cool from my perspective. Um, so until here, I prepared these slides at some point because I had to give a talk. Um, until here, um, I was then checking how much does that cost. So all this image generation I showed before, I spent some afternoons in producing these notebooks, demonstrating these things. I was running Napari ChatGPT on my laptop, and by the end of these um, hmm, 10 days, 12 days, I paid something like $4. So some people are a bit afraid of, oh, that costs money, and yes, it's a paradigm change. We are suddenly paying for executing Python code. It's like a new thing. But yeah, I would like to take a little bit the fear that it's like not overly expensive. We are not paying hundreds of dollars here for doing crappy stuff. So also later in the exercise, if you want to try out these things yourself, you will pay some cents by the end of the day, but it, it will not be a, a super expensive. So that's just to get um, N equals one some data point. Then I was traveling a bit, um, uh, also gave a course about um, Napari, not Napari ChatGPT, about ChatGPT and how we were using it. Um, I was traveling a bit and I met Christian Tischer and Christian Tischer said, oh, can we maybe make it in a Jupyter notebook that it like not just execute things like Langchain does, but can we ask it to execute code and put it in the next cell? So Christian came up with that so that we here now in the Jupyter notebook can say something like segment the image and show the result. And ChatGPT under the hood, we called it Bob, will produce code which you can then execute yourself. So instead of like also how Napari ChatGPT does it, instead of executing the code for you and showing you just the result, we see the Python code, we can modify it. 
Um, and then we can basically um, execute it ourselves and make a decision if we execute the code or not. We can also save this notebook where the prompt and the code are saved together and can have a look at it later um, for reproducibility reasons. So this tool basically works like that. You use this Bob magic to write then a prompt behind. Um, and for you in this case, load the blob stiff image and show it. Um, and then it will then produce this code, which you can execute yourself. So this is like a short prompt, it's like percentage Bob. Um, you can also say percentage percentage Bob and then write multiple lines of text below. So here in this case, load blob stiff grayscale image from disk. Segment the nuclei looking object uh, using OZU's method and connected component labeling. Uh, measure the area of the segmented labels and print the area on top of the label. So it's like step by step, giving instructions of things to do in one shot. Um, and it will do that. So it will then produce code like this, and the result will look like that. No guarantee that it works in all cases. We have seen before that there are sometimes some weak points, um, but the technology is really powerful. Um, also here, why are we working on that? Um, the point is you can also upload your data to ChatGPT, to OpenAI, to the server and analyze it there. It has pretty much the same features, but then you would have to upload your data. <laughs> and we are not so happy with that. Sometimes we just, uh, also the data we work with, sometimes Tristan and me and also others is big. So uploading it to an OpenAI server is not technically not an option and also data protection wise not a good idea. So we want to run this locally on our machine and only send this little text to the OpenAI server where they cannot really guess of what kind of image analysis we are performing here. Um, also here, um, as I explained earlier, as I've shown earlier, also Bob's capabilities are limited. So if you ask for counting the number of neighbors, it's now similar to drawing this mesh between the neighbors before. Um, it will give you an answer. It will also produce code and this code may crash. So maybe that's an option for playing later as an exercise related to that. I think one can make that work, but I'm not 100% sure. So maybe one of you finds a good solution for that. Um, just summarizing some of the challenges we are now facing when we work with these kind of tools. Obviously, I already mentioned we do not want to upload our data. Um, we also should not um, upload um, sensitive information to OpenAI. So, for example, if you ask Langchain and OpenAI to write an email for you, um, you should not put personal information from other people in there. Imagine, imagine you are a medical doctor and you ask ChatGPT to write an email to a patient informing them of what disease they have. This information goes to the OpenAI server. You should not do these kind of things. So be careful when using it. Um, then there is also discussion about the computational costs of training these neural networks. Um, so the CO2 footprint, it's very expensive to run that, right? You burn a lot of energy when you train such a model, and that's why also only um, the big companies have access to that, which is bad from some perspective, right? So it's not a thing somebody trains on their laptop. Um, there's a bias in there. So when I generated these images, um, a nice photo of a human, um, I was actually surprised that half of them are male or half of them look male and half of them look female. But what was also not surprising at all is like that they're all white. So apparently in the training data, there are some bias. Um, so we have to figure out how to train models so that they properly, for example, reflect uh, how a human looks like. Um, and it does have hallucinations. You have also seen that before in the Python code, which didn't work. Here, that was a fun case. So because I asked um, ChatGPT who developed Kadoop. Kadoop is the graph analysis library. Um, and it then says Felix Naumann from the Institute in Potsdam did it. Um, but in fact, it's from Scott AI from the people in Leipzig. <laughs> That's not true. Um, there's also glitch tokens where you can, for example, enter some sentences um, and then you can break some security barriers or can break the model itself. So there's yeah, it's some technically some technical challenges. Um, like you can produce a lot of uh, for fake news, false information with that. Um, so these kind of things will challenge us for some more time. And now that I was working with this technology for some time, I can also tell that debugging is very hard. If you phrase a prompt and this prompt delivers a piece of code or an image or something, that's great. If it does not work, um, it's super hard to figure out which part of my sentence I have to change in order to make that better, um, to make that work better. Um, for further reading, I can highly recommend here um, reading, watching um, the video from Louis Groyer, where he is talking about um, his Napari plugin. 
Um, I think with Stefan Barfeld, Stefan Breibisch from Geneva, so they are having some chat about that. I can highly recommend this video. And Sreni, Digital Sreni, is explaining a lot of things um, in his YouTube channel um, in the context of generative AI in very general, and also recently made some um, nice videos about um, segment anything and language models, this kind of things. I can highly recommend that. Before I conclude some exercises, so we have now time. The session would go for another uh, almost an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. So you can do these exercises now. I can also show some of the stuff if you like, um, but I would basically leave it to you how you use the time. If you do not have Python on your computer at all, you should first install it. And here you find this blog post link from Maha Lampert. Um, who introduces you how to install um, Mamba, Mamba Forge on your computer where then installation goes faster than with Conda. Um, so I really recommend using Mamba nowadays because Conda is quite slow. Um, Mamba is just faster. It's basically the difference. Um, then you can, for example, use here this first line to set up a Conda environment, which has a lot of image processing tools installed, namely Death by Anapari, um, which comes with a lot of libraries which are then useful for the step afterwards. Um, also the second line, how to activate this environment, but it's kind of optional. If you have a functional Python environment in a Conda installation, it's all good. You can just use that. Um, then if you want to if you want to try the exercises I will show next, um, you have to get an OpenAI API key. So really, you have to. That's kind of necessary and it will cost money. So you will, by the end of the day, pay a couple of cents. Um, this is how you can install OpenAI and how you can install Biobob. Um, then you can start um, Jupyter Lab, and in Jupyter Lab, the first thing you should do, you should enter these two lines of code um, to set this API key. So you should enter your API key here, um, so that you can actually use the OpenAI infrastructure. And then afterwards, you can, for example, say from via Bob import Bob, and then you can say Bob load blobs.tiff and show it. So that's maybe an easy notebook for getting started. You find also here on the bottom, you find a link to this notebook, so you don't have to type this from the slide. You can just use this notebook there. Um, yeah, download plops the TIFF and open it, segment it. So that would maybe be a good first exercise to try things out. Um, here's also another uh, slide showing you how you can enter the OpenAI API key in Windows, how you can add it to your system environment. Then you can basically skip the first two lines in this demo notebook. You don't have to enter this key again and again um, in notebooks. I would anyway recommend to do it like that and not put the API key in notebooks, in particular when to share this notebook with other people. Because if you share the key with other people, the other people can then use OpenAI and you pay. Um, the first realistic exercise would, for example, be this one. Load the human mitosis data set um, and ask it to segment these objects. So here this example shows it with blobs to TIFF, and you should basically adapt this example to work on the human mitosis data set and then play a bit with it and try to figure out how, how do you have to give instructions so that the segmentation starts looking better. Um, then a nice experiment one can do. So Christian Fischer again pointed me to the fact that ChatGPT4, this model, is a bit smarter, was trained on different input data than ChatGPT 3.5. Um, so you can change with mod which model you are using under the hood when you use Bob. You can, for example, initialize it here as GPT-4, and then the responses become really different. So I have just played a bit with that. I tend to confirm what Christian was saying. ChatGPT-4 knows more functions, is a little bit better, produces higher quality code, um, but I haven't done any qualitative analysis on this yet. So this is gut feeling, and you can also get some gut feeling by calling this line. Um, so for example, if I ask, this is one example I found, um, if I ask uh, Bob, can you please apply Voronow to labeling to an image, then ChatGPT 3.5 doesn't know how to do this or will hallucinate a function which does this to some degree. Um, but there are these functions exist actually in at least two libraries out there, um, and ChatGPT 4 is apparently aware of them, so it can call them. Um, if you want to know which models are available, you can also call this function, which was also programmed by Christian. Um, I would say that not all of these models work. Um, but you can try some of them out, in particular those which start with some ChatGPT 4, ChatGPT 3.5 there might be interesting. Um, from Loic, from discussions with Loic, I know that there are some models which do not work at all, which produce really, really bad results. Um, and again, we 
presume that GPT-4 is maybe the smartest model which is at the moment available. Uh, yeah, one more hint, by the way. If you use this one, it's a bit more expensive um, than 3.5. Um, then another fun exercise, generating images. So this is also a Python Jupyter Notebook you can download where you provide a prompt. And then you can, for example, produce histology images of lung cancer. So for somebody who sees a histology image for the first time or has just seen some before might say, hey, yeah, cool. This looks like a realistic image. <laughs> but when you look a bit closer, you will maybe realize that there are some nuclear missing here. So execute this prompt a couple of times. Um, it's really fascinating how histology images, how different they can look like if DALI is producing them. So maybe there are not so much images of that kind in the training data. Um, then you can also use that the exercise here generated, uh, generate some fluorescent microscopy images of nuclei and membranes. And a little spoiler, this is super challenging. So if you do not manage in 20 minutes, go to the next exercise. If, if possibly, it's possible that this is not possible. <laughs> Um, also, when I did this last uh, in the course in Heidelberg a couple of weeks ago, there was somebody um, putting cats in the microscopy images. Also, these results are fun, so you should definitely try this out. Um, yeah, uh, then the lung chain exercise. So you saw this notebook I've, I've shown earlier where you used um, lung chain to execute Python functions using a language model. Um, put in, so this is again the slide. Um, put in a hello world statement in one of the functions or in both in the reverse function in the uppercase function and see um, when this is actually printed because it is quite interesting under which circumstances Langchain actually executes the function and sometimes it does not execute the function. I would love to have a discussion with you what's happening here. I think I have an idea, um, but maybe you have another idea. It would be very interesting to see. And last but not least, if you want to, it's like more exercise you can do in 45 minutes, right? So choose a bit. Um, also try and install pip install Napari chat GPT. Install this Napari plugin from Louis Groyer. And for example, try to segment blobs.tiff or ask it to produce a widget which can segment blobs.tiff. Try that out. Um, and yeah, let us know how it goes. Or if it does not work, we can maybe speculate a bit together. So again, I would like to have that as a kind of an interactive session. So I would love to see what you guys are trying, and then we can maybe speculate a bit together. I would like to thank some people, in particular Christian, who really provided code and was like quite actively working together with me on that um, uh, Bayer Bob tool recently, um, Kevin Yamauchi, who also did uh, quite some stuff before. So I think the tool wouldn't be what it is now without these two guys. Um, and also Loïc, who was basically uh, the first one Use it. The first one I know uh, from my little bubble on the internet who was using uh, language models to produce code, to analyze images, to process images with Napari chat GPT um, was a huge inspiration. And I would not have started this project if Loic didn't. Um, I also would like to thank my team who is uh, taking care of the daily business <laughs> while I'm making slides about language models. Um, I'm very glad that I have them. So uh, that's it for my presentation. I would now stop sharing screen. Um, I would also pay, but I, I think I cannot stop recording. I'm not sure. I would stop recording here now so that we can have a free and open discussion.